Hello Algebra 1 students, welcome back to our Topic 5 lessons on piecewise and linear absolute value functions. Um, this is unlabeled, but it should say uh, Lesson 5.3 uh, for piecewise functions and absolute value. This is what I consider our crossover episode. We're going to start with, that, uh, with piecewise functions that we should be decent with so far and move into the absolute value realm. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of review. So we're going to start with this friendly piecewise function that's right here. Um, I would like you please to graph uh, this piecewise function where one branch is x for x greater than or equal to 0 and the second branch negative x for x less than 0 uh, and then evaluate each of those points. Once you're done, come on back and we'll see how you did. Okay, hopefully we realize that there is that um, kind of split or that wall at x equals 0. Okay. Anything to the left is x less than 0, and to the right is x greater than 0. So if we start with the x greater than 0, um, we can use that fun trick where we just substitute in 0 here, and it tells you that when you substitute in 0, the output is 0. It's a closed circle because of that equal sign, and then we need the slope. The slope shouldn't be too terrible to see, it's just the one that's in front. The greater than side is to the right. Up 1 over 1, and we move up here. There we go. For the less than 0, we use the same trick. We substitute in 0, and you get negative 0, but negative 0 is the same as 0. Uh, so we again get that same starting point, which is kind of weird, because this starting point it has no equal sign. So if you wanted to see it on here, I'll just kind of outline this in yellow. Um, there is a point there. Norm I think normally we wouldn't put that open circle there because a closed circle takes precedence or priority over an open circle, but I think it's also nice to see. Then we need that slope, which is a negative 1. So down 1 over 1 would take you to the right, but that wouldn't be a function, so that doesn't make sense. Notice that this should only be for x is less than 0, and less than 0 is on the left side. So if you follow that pattern up to the left, I think you can see that the rest of our points will lead us up here. All right, we've got our graph. Now we need to find our points. The first point we need to find is f of 4. To find f of 4, we need to use this original branch or this top branch of our piecewise function because 4 is greater than 0. So to find f of 4, we take the x and replace it with 4. So f of 4 is just 4. You can also see that point on our graph. It's the point input of 4, output of 4, which is right there. All right, let's look at our next one. Uh, so this one was 4. The next one is 0. Which branch is in control of 0? Well, when x equals 0, that's the top branch. When you substitute in 0, you just get 0. Well, it seems like so far, whatever number you substitute in, you get the same answer back out. So let's try the last one. Uh, the last one is negative 4. With negative 4, we use the less than function. And this one has that extra negative out front. And when you substitute a negative 4 into something that's already negative, this ends up becoming positive 4. We can see all, each of those points, negative 4, 4, negative 4, comma, 4 is on our graph. And of course, 0, 0 is the origin. That's what we saw over here. In fact, you might realize that regardless of the value that you substitute into f of x, the output is always what type of a number? Oh yeah, the output is always a positive number. And that's because any x less than 0 is negative, and then you substitute in for something that's already negative, and that turns it into a positive. For the positive numbers, they stay positive. It's actually very important in math and in life uh, to have a function which always gives us positive values as the outputs, as the answers. And that's because many situations in life measure, well, for example, how far away you are from some point. In distance, we always like to be positive, right? It's kind of weird to say, oh, I'm negative six steps away from uh, the kitchen. No, you're just six steps away. It doesn't matter where you're standing. In fact, we have a special name for this function that makes all of our inputs become positive. This function is known as the absolute value function. 
And you're actually supposed to have seen absolute value before, but maybe you don't remember, maybe you do, so we'll do a quick review here. We usually write absolute value using a set of vertical lines. Do we see the vertical lines that surround negative 4? For example, if we see those vertical lines around negative 4, we read that as the absolute value of negative 4. And the answer to the absolute value of negative 4 is 4. Absolute value always gives the distance a number is from 0, and the distance will always be positive. Here's one more. The absolute value of 4 equals 4. Some students think absolute value changes the sign, and that's not true. A negative changes the sign. Absolute value always causes the result to become positive. Now realize, absolute value is doing exactly what our piecewise function up above did. This piecewise function allowed us to input a number and always gave us a positive answer. And it's true, absolute value can always be rewritten as a piecewise function. In fact, we can say that the function f of x that's equal to this piecewise function is the same as f of x equals the absolute value of x. If you plug 7 in here, the answer is 7. 7 in here, the answer is 7. If you put in negative 7 here and use the correct branch, negative 7, the answer is positive 7. They do the exact same thing. Now, would you rather write this piecewise function or just this little absolute value function? The absolute value was invented for the sake of efficiency, but it's really important to realize that you can always rewrite absolute values a piecewise, and we're going to talk more about that later on. Now, by the way, this year, the absolute value function we study is only for linear absolute value functions. So each of these branches are always going to make lines, and because of that, our absolute value function is generally going to make um, a shape that you make out of lines as well. Now, we said that the piecewise functions that make up our absolute value equations this year only use lines, which is why I call this linear absolute value. Okay, let's go ahead and get some practice in. We're going to find each value below. And by the way, and I'll mention this again later, your calculator, most basic calculators, do not have an absolute value button. So you're going to have to do a little bit of math on your own without your calculator. Okay, so let's begin. Um, let f of x equals the absolute value of x, and find f of 3. Well, f of 3 just means substitute 3 in for the absolute value. Absolute value of 3 is 3. Absolute value of negative 2 is 2, and absolute value of 0 is just 0. Not bad. Let's try the next one. This is 2 absolute value of x. Now, with pretty much any mathematical expression, if a number is right next to a variable, or grouping, because absolute value is just like parentheses, is like grouping, uh, this is multiplying. So, in order to evaluate this, this is going to be 2 times the absolute value of 1. Well, do we do the multiplication first, or do I apply the absolute value first? I mentioned that absolute value is kind of like a type of parentheses, or sometimes you call it grouping. And so that means we need to do or apply the absolute value first. The absolute value of 1 is 1. And notice now I changed the absolute value to parentheses because I've used the absolute value. And then we finish with 2 times 1, which is 2. So when I do something like this, okay, what is the absolute value of negative 1? Well, that's positive 1. And 2 times 1 is again 2. So g of 1 and g of negative 1 were the same value. g of 0, 2 times the absolute value of 0 is just 2 times 0, which is, no surprise, 0. One more. Let h of x equal 2 times the absolute value of x minus 4 and find h of 3. Well, this becomes 2 times the absolute value of 3 minus 4. Remember PEMDAS, and I'll write it out over here for you. The first thing we apply is the parentheses, which is, in this case, like absolute value. So 2 times positive 3 minus 4. Then PEMDAS says do multiplication and division. 2 times 3 is 6. And then we do the addition and subtraction, and 6 minus 4 gets you 2. Let's look at a couple others. 2 times the absolute value of 1 minus 4 becomes 2 times 1 minus 4. 2 times 1 is 2, and 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Last one. 2 times the absolute value of negative 1 half minus 4. 2 times, well, it's the absolute value of negative 1 half is 1 half. 
half of two is one, and one minus four is negative three. Now, um, some students will say that, oh, absolute value always makes the answer positive. And although they're right, don't forget that there could be other numbers, other operations in an equation besides absolute value. That means that we can still get negative answers. For example, if you look at B and C over here, this absolute value part absolutely gave you a positive answer each time. But then when you applied the other numbers, the two and the negative four, that actually gave you some negative answers on B and C. So it is still possible to get negatives from absolute value, but the absolute value itself will always return a positive answer. Okay, let's look at a couple more idiosyncrasies or strangeness or weirdnesses about absolute value. The first thing, sometimes students are tempted to simplify an absolute value expression. And they say, oh, two times the absolute value of x minus four. Well, I know what absolute value does. Absolute value turns everything positive. So they take this negative four and they make it a positive, right? So um, they change that because absolute value always gives a positive answer. However, absolute value does not work that way. For now, we're only going to use absolute value if there's a single number inside. Sometimes you might have to simplify to get to that single number inside. For example, the absolute value of two minus six is not two plus six. Do you see what they did by changing this to a positive? Right, two plus six is eight. We can evaluate this using PEMDAS. Do what's inside the parentheses first. Two minus six is negative four. Then, apply the parentheses, or absolute value in this case, and the absolute value of negative four is positive four. Can we see that by changing this, we don't get the correct answer? We have to follow PEMDAS. And again, as mentioned, there is no absolute value button on your blue scientific calculator, so be very careful here. All right, there is one other important piece of information for this. When absolute value is applied to an expression, we do treat it as a form of grouping or parentheses, that's why we talk about PEMDAS, but distributive property does not work with absolute value. So if you have a number on the outside, we are not allowed to distribute that to the inside. That too is stuck on the outside. Remember please, distributive property is just a shortcut and actually generally from here for most of the rest of Algebra 1, distributive property is not going to work. And so I'd really suggest that you focus on using PEMDAS. Even though distributive property sometimes is good and useful, there are almost always other ways to solve an equation without it. So let's go ahead and try a few of these. f of x equals 2, parentheses x minus 1, I said parentheses, I'm at absolute value, minus 1. So I bet you guys can probably tackle this one. Why don't you try each of these, and you can use the calculator to assist you, but remember, you need the absolute value on your own. Good luck. All right, so if we want to find f of 3 to absolute value, whew, um, something like that, you'll notice that I try to put those caps and bases on my 1s so that you don't confuse them with the absolute value. Sometimes other people will make the absolute value like really large so you don't get confused too. It's up to you. And then we're substituting in 3. How does this work? Well, let's do a little mental math. 3 minus 1 is 2, and the absolute value of 2 is still 2. So now we've used the absolute value. The rest isn't too terrible. 4 minus 1 is 3. Let's try f of 0. I'm just going to recopy this guy again. f of 0 is taking the place of the x. Again, a little mental math. This is negative 1 but then the absolute value of negative one is positive one. So we get two minus one, which is one. Last one, two absolute value, minus one with a minus one, and we're substituting in negative five this time. Okay. And we end up with negative five minus one, which is negative six, and then the absolute value of negative six is positive six. It gives me 12 minus one, which is 11. I also get one more. Let g of x equal the negative absolute value of x plus 1. 
Well, there's a few ways to look at this. Um, first, we could just go through and try to substitute, the, substitute that straight in. Negative absolute value, plus 1, close the absolute value, and substitute in 4. Going step by step here, it becomes negative, and then 4 plus 1 is 5. The absolute value of 5 is just 5, and then there's a negative, so this becomes negative 5. The other way you can think about this, of course, is by putting a negative 1 out front and saying that it's multiplying. Either way should get you the same answer. So let's try g of negative 1. Same setup. This becomes negative 1 right here. And then as we go through, uh, negative 1 plus 1 is 0. Absolute value of 0 is 0, and that becomes 0. Last one. Substitute in negative 4. Negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3. Absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. And then there's a negative waiting just to turn it back to a negative again. Notice we could not combine those to make a positive. That would be like distributive property. Can't do that at all. These two need to go through and be um, evaluated separately. Okay. Now, with any new function, we also like to look at the graph to get a visual picture of the situation. Now, based on the opener, let's take a quick peek at the opener up here, um, we're going to actually, we can already see the shape of an absolute value graph, because this is what we said um, you can define linear absolute value as. So what shape, how would you describe the shape of that graph? Oh, yeah, it's a V, right? So um, our linear absolute value functions are going to make the shape of a V. In fact, the linear absolute value function y equals the absolute value of x is the most important absolute value function you'll learn this year. It's so important that it's actually given the name of the parent function for all linear absolute value equations. Think of all the other equations with absolute value as that parent function's child. So let's make sure we remember how to graph any equation using a table, and then we'll try to answer a couple questions. So, um, if we want to create a table that's going to help us graph, we need a whole list of inputs, a whole list of x's. Now, you can pick any x's you want, but to speed things up, I picked them for you. I have all these inputs over here. We need to input those into our equation. We need to do the math, and then once we're done doing the math, we should have a point. Now, notice we already have all the x's for the points, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. We just need the outputs. How do we do the outputs? Well, we take the function, which is the absolute value of whatever the input is, and we substitute that in. I'm just getting everything set up, and now we substitute. We're substituting in negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and so on and so forth. When we get our answers, positive 3, 2, 1, 0, positive 1, 2, and 3. Go ahead and graph these seven points here, and let's see how we're doing. Negative 3, comma 3 is here. Negative 2, 2, 1, 1, 0, 0. And now we get to 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3. Do we see the shape that we expected? Well, I hope so. This to me makes a V-shaped graph, which our linear absolute value equations are always going to do. Okay. To finish this off, we are going to um, write the domain and range for this graph. And this is some good reminders of what we've done over the last couple of units. The domain for this is going to be which x's are on the graph. Or another way to think of it is how wide does the graph get? Well, there's an x of 1 on my graph, it's that point. An x of 2, 3, 4, 5 is on the graph, but is 6 on the graph? Well, yeah, it is, because there's an arrow, so it keeps going forever and ever. In fact, I think any number all the way up to infinity on the right will be on the graph. What about the left? Well, there's certainly negative 1, 2, 3, all negative 5, negative 6 is here, negative 7, and so on and so forth, because, of course, this graph goes up forever and ever. So I think every x value is on this graph. Another way to think about it is, is this graph gets infinitely wide, right? It's getting wider and wider and wider, so we can see either that our domain is all real numbers, that means we can use any x value, or you could say the x values go from negative infinity to infinity. 
right? And we know that um, and can write that with parentheses because parentheses mean not equal to and you can't be equal to infinity. Let's take a peek at the range. Range-wise, right, um, we're going to do the same thing, but the range measures the outputs or the y's in this case. So if we look at this graph, let's check out the y values. There's certainly a y value of 1. In fact, there's two of them. They match up twice, but that's okay. That's allowed. Our function is only not a function if it fails the vertical line test, not the horizontal line test. 2 is on here twice again, and 3. 4 is on here, 5 is on here, and because this graph keeps going up forever and ever, I think certainly all the positive y's will be on this graph. Yeah, however, is 0 on the graph? Yeah, there's this point 0, comma 0, there's a y of 0. What about below 0? Is negative 1 on the graph? Well, no, I don't think there's a point on the graph that has a y of negative 1, nor is negative 2 or 3 or 4 or so on and so forth. So we always like to think of range as like how tall and short the graph gets. The graph goes up forever, so it goes up to infinity. But there is a limit to the bottom of the graph. The lowest it ever gets is down to zero. So we have two ways to write this. We can either say that y is greater than or equal to zero, right? The y's on this graph are zero or larger. The other way we can say it is that this graph starts at a y of 0, and it can be equal to 0 because there's a closed circle there. And then it goes up, 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 up to where? Well, it goes up to infinity. You need to memorize this graph. This graph starts at 0, 0, and goes up 1 over 1 in each direction. Memorize, memorize, memorize. We do not want to make a table every time. We need to know the parent function for linear absolute value. Okay, we're going to jump into some practice problems, so it's your guys' turn to try a few. I wish you the best, and once you're done, we'll come back together and check your work. Okay, we have two functions defined below, f of x, which is a piecewise function, and g of x, which is a um, linear absolute value function. Let's go ahead and just compare the two, since that's our whole, really, theme of this unit. So, uh, part A, we have f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, and then g of 0, g of 1, g of 2. And we're just going to work horizontally here. So if we work f of 0, okay, 0 is less than 1, uh, so I think we have to use this bottom branch of the piecewise function, negative 2 times 0 minus 1 minus 3. Okay, and you can use a calculator if you'd like. I'm just going to work out the PEMDAS since I have the space here. Uh, it seems like we end up with negative 1. Okay. When I do f of 1, let's see, 1 is equal to 1, which is that equation over there. And that's 2 times 1 minus 5. 2 minus 5, which is negative 3. And then f of 2. 2 is greater than 1, so that's 2 times 2 minus 5. 4 minus 5, which is back to negative 1 again. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a peek at the g function. g of 0 means take 0 and substitute it in for the x there. So it's 2 absolute value, 0 minus 1 minus 3. So reducing that absolute value or simplifying it, I guess, we get negative 1 minus 3. Absolute value of negative 1 is positive 1 minus 3. Okay, 2 times 1 minus 3, that becomes 2 minus 3, which is negative 1. Uh, g of 1, we get 1 minus 1 inside that absolute value. And that becomes 2 times 0 minus 3, which is 0 minus 3, so negative 3. And our last one, absolute value 2 minus 1 minus 3. 2 times 1 minus 3. Absolute value of 1 is still 1 becomes 2 minus 3, which is also negative 1. Okay, well, what should we notice about the values we found for f of x versus g of x? Well, when we found f of 0, the answer was negative 1. And when we found g of 0, the answer was also negative 1. Huh. Well, when we found f of 1, the answer was negative 3. And g of 1, the answer was also negative 3. And oh my gosh, it looks like something crazy is happening. Maybe just maybe those functions are actually the same, just written in a different way.
We've discussed before that absolute value can always be written as a piecewise function, and this is an example of one. This piecewise function is the exact same as the absolute value on the right. We're still not quite sure how to write one as the other, but for now, um, we should probably note that they are the same outputs for the same inputs. And part C does confirm that g of x and f of x are the same function. And because we know that, without even graphing this piecewise function, but knowing that the absolute value is the same, what shape is the graph of the piecewise function going to make? Well, it's going to make a v. And it's going to make a v because g of x is linear piece or linear absolute value, which always makes a v. And if they're the same, they have to make the same graph. So let's go ahead and actually make a table for this really quickly and see what we can do. I think we found some of these already. We already found the outputs for 0, 1, and 2. So 0, 1, 2. I might as well put the rest of these in here, right? Um, we found that 0 was negative 1, then negative 3, then negative 1. Um, negative 1, negative 3, negative 1. That looks pretty good. We do still have a few more to evaluate. And it's your choice on which function you'd like to use because they give you the same answer. I think for x is greater than 1, that guy's probably the easiest. So 2x minus 5 is greater than 1. 2x minus 5, that's 6 minus 5, that's 1. And then 2x minus 5, that's 8 minus 5, that's 3. All right, so then when we go... Um, less than 1. You could either use this one or this one. They're really going to accomplish the same thing. I'll do the absolute value function this time. 2 absolute value of x minus 1 minus 3. Um, so 2 absolute value of x minus 1 minus 3. Uh, this is negative 2, which then becomes positive 2. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 minus 3 is 1. And then same thing up here. 2 absolute value of negative 2 minus 1 minus 3. That's negative 3. Absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. 3 times 2 is 6. 6 minus 3 is 3. All right, and then we go through and get this done. Negative 2 comma 3, negative 1 comma 1. I'm just graphing each of these points. Here comes 0, negative 1, uh, 1, negative 3, 2, negative 1, 3, 1, and 4, 3. And looking at this graph, can we see once we connect these points that it does indeed make a V-shaped graph? It's exciting. And remember, this is both the graph of f of x and of g of x. All right, well, what about that domain and range? Well, I've got a secret for you. Um, unless we're doing just a single, well, unless we're just doing a piecewise function that's not absolute value, generally our domain is going to be all real numbers, right? This graph gets infinitely wide, or you could think it uses every x. We are going to be all real numbers. The other way we can write that, though, is because we go from negative infinity to infinity, we go like this. Now, the range measures how tall or what y values are on the graph. I think there's kind of a floor to this graph. The lowest it gets is 3. The highest it gets, though, is all the way up to infinity. So if we wanted to use that interval notation, we could say it starts at, and it should say negative 3, sorry, starts at negative 3. It can be equal. There's a closed circle, so remember, that's our equal to. And it goes all the way up to infinity. We can never be equal to infinity. It's always parentheses there. The other way to write that is now we're talking about the y values. The lowest y value is negative 3, and we use any y greater than that. So we can say that the y's are greater than or equal to negative 3. All right, last page. This last page just has some extra practice for you, has some practice evaluating, right, and doing that both with um, absolute value equations and a piecewise, and then rewriting some piecewise functions, and then finishing off with that parent function that you should have memorized. So. Good luck finishing all of this off. Um, if you need, your teacher will have worked out solutions for this where you can check your work, but I don't think you'll need me to talk you through it. It's all review at this point. I have absolute faith in all of you to do excellent work. 
So thank you as always for tuning in. I'm excited to watch your success and come back next class for lesson 5.4, which is going to start to teach you some absolute value shortcuts.